So as you know, this is a picture of uh, Dr. P.I. Brandemark. And in 1952, Dr. Brandemark was doing a uh, study where he had a titanium tube inserted in the femur of a rabbit, and he was, he was studying the blood flow. When he went to take the titanium tube out, he couldn't get it out. And that's basically in 1952 when he discovered that bone liked to integrate or attach to titanium. <clears throat> and he coined the term osseointegration. So that came from Dr. Brandemark. And at the same time, Dr. Linkow in New York was doing a lot of studying with um, dental implants, but he was doing blade implants as well as subperiosteal implants, which I did in my residency, um, but we really don't do that anymore. Interestingly enough, Dr. Brandemark um, being an, an, in, uh, an entrepreneur inventor for 30 years developing dental implants was not well respected, was not well received in the field and it wasn't until 1983 when he went to the uh, Montreal um, uh, Dental Convention where actually implants really began to take off. A new generation of dentists was coming up and they decided this was a good idea all in all. So here's what I found. I find or found that I've been a member of the Academy of Osseointegration for years and I would go to their meetings. It's a wonderful meeting. It's a very scientific meeting. And I would walk around to the different booths and talk to the different um, implant companies. And I found that, as you will too, most implants look like a screw. Now there's every shape and size and thread design, coating design, platform diameter, length, they change all of that, but the basic problem is that I found was they're round, they're a round cylinder. And, and they work great in the anterior area when you take out a single rooted tooth and you have the socket that Dr. Ranahan does and there's a nice round oval socket left, a, a titanium screw thread is perfect. It works great. They integrate, we know they integrate, you can be re they can be restored. The industry now is making them pink and they're um, making, uh, we've changed so much over the years since I've been doing implants t and a lot of great innovation. But in essence, they're all still around implant. And so you, this is a, a, an Astrotech OsseoSpeed implant here. <clears throat> so you take out this tooth, you put this in, it integrates. Dr. Ranahan and I, we like to use the Nobel Active, a very aggressive implant. The, you get primary stability and, they're, and they work just perfect here. However, molars, which is 70% of the market, are multi-rooted, typically three roots. When you take out a molar implant, the footprint is a rectangle. And that is uh, a fact. That's the, way that's the way teeth are designed. And the implants are, are round. So we were, we're now putting a round peg in a square rectangular space. And that's causing a lot of problems, what we see over and over. We now, and I'll show you more examples of this, but what we get when we do that, we have these large embrasures. They're not natural. They trap food. This tooth here had a root canal of crown, recurrent decay right there. This is starting to get recurrent decay. So in my opinion, what we've been doing is iatrogenic. In other words, we're causing a problem that's the direct result of us. So what's the solution in the industry? Larger, rounder implants. Well, you can do that to a degree, but you're still trying to fill this rectangular space with a round peg. We can make it bigger. Well, in this case, if this was a southern implant, like a nine millimeter large southern implant, well, you've run out of bone there, and that obviously won't work. And it still leaves the problem of these gaps between the adjacent teeth. These are some examples of, uh, as I said, I, in my practice, with my four partners and we're by a really large army base and these we see the dependence of the soldiers and they come from all over the world and and they've been deployed um, literally everywhere and they come in and I get to see the results from uh, a, a wide range of uh, way of, uh, implants are treated <clears throat> these of course these are actually Zimmer implants that were put in and in order and from the, the, the lady who's the lab person this is a problem for the labs. You put a round peg in this rectangular space and now we have cantilevered unsupported porcelain, which of course is a problem of fracture, trapping food. Um, but when I, when I got this idea, <clears throat> and, and Bra Dr. Ranahan and the surgeon in this room, Dr. Ranahan is one of my best friends, but I, I tell him, I say, Brad, 
you, ha- you have no patience. He, he doesn't have patience. The only time he gets a patient is when I send it to him, and we send him a lot. But when we send him a patient, he sees the patient, does his treatment, and sends him back to me. And I have some patients that have been my patients for 33 years because I've been in practice that long. I've been in 37, but I did a residency for a while. So these are friends now. These are people that really rely on me. <clears throat> so when I see a patient with an implant, and that was what that first slide was, one of the first slides, to me, the, 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 I'm in business there for the patient. That's why I exist as a dentist. I need to take care of this patient and treat them as if they were my friend, and hopefully they'll become my friend. Then from there, I'll send the patient, to, let's say, to Dr. Ranahan. He does the implant, and then he sends the patient back to me. So it's back to my responsibility to restore it. And then what do I do? I rely on the dental lab. And if I don't give, if this is what I gave the lab, this is a stock abutment, and now for the last couple of years, my labs and me, we do everything as a custom abutment, which is probably the same in this country. We don't have this kind of issue anymore. But nevertheless, the, the, the lab then takes what I give them to make me a tooth that looks like a crown, and they can't because of this round peg. Even with a custom abutment, it's still follows the emergence profile of the tissue. Well, that's not how a tooth works. A tooth comes out of the bone. It doesn't come up, and then you have this tissue emergence. But, but yet, that's the only option they have. So when I formed this idea, and then it morphed into this company, my concern was the patient. What can I do to this patient so that they don't end up like this? This is my patient. She came in to me, and I said, oh, I say, how's your implant? How's it doing? Well, I love it. I can chew on it. It's solid. It's great. She said, but here's the problem. I, I get food caught up in there. So I said, well, let me have a look. So she came in, sat down. I took out my intraoral camera, and this is exactly what I found. She had all this food, bacteria, material alba trapped in between her teeth, under the gum, inflammation on the tissue here. And she said, I want you to fix it. And it's like, there's no fix. There's nothing I can do. Oh, I'm sorry. I said, there's nothing I can do except give you some floss or something else to clean it out. So now, now this is the joke of the day, so get ready. All right. So um, I said, well, all this, like Dr. Brandemark, <clears throat> he took the bone integration and calls it osseointegration. If anything else, I want to be this. I've named this the blad effect because everything she gets caught is there. And BLAD stands for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Okay, that's, that's more of a joke than I ever had before. So anyways, so, that's, so all that trapped in there is constant to the patient. Well, as you can see, we have an, an amalgam here, and, and all this bacteria is going to be held here and held here. And what's it going to do? This is going to get recurrent decay. This is going to, you're going to have peri-implantitis. You're going to get recurrent decay, and, and it's, I think it's my fault. And so um, that's what I decided to try and solve. This is my partner's patient. And you can see that it's good horizontal bone, very few restorations, nice and healthy um, tissue, good oral hygiene. <clears throat> and, and yet, in 2011, he did this implant. Again, custom abutment. That's a Nobel active implant, very well restored. And, and yet, that doesn't look like a tooth. This looks like a tooth and a crown. This does not. And yet this industry accepts this as standard of care. And, and I wouldn't. So she came back a year later, one year later, and for a hygiene, and comes in, and here we go. Decay, right there. And so now, whose fault is it? She has great oral hygiene. And, and yet, in a year, she comes in, and we have a, ca- uh, a cavity there because we have all this food trapped under there following the emergence profile of the tissue. So that was kind of the problem. This is my patient here that came in. We, I restored this implant. Again, very, very nice hygiene. And I was just showing her how to floss. And this is what we expect patients to do to keep these crowns clean. In our country, the statistic is we estimate, there's no real way of knowing, 5% of the people in our country floss their teeth. And I think that's probably high. And now we're asking our patients to take this floss, go down under here, clean all this area out, down under here on the mesial, clean it out on the distal. It's unrealistic. <clears throat> Again, with a, 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 
so in that circle, we have the patient in the center, the, the dentist, the family dentist, refers to the oral surgeon, send it to the lab, and then who's responsible really for maintaining it? The dental hygienist. So we have a dental hygienist on, uh, in our company who will be going out and speaking to other hygienists because we then give them that problem of uh, instructing the patient how to clean their teeth and what to do to get down in these areas and, and clean it out. And it's totally unrealistic. <clears throat> and as you know, implants are basically fused to the bone so they're ankylosed. And one of the members on our board, who is the editor of the Journal of, Max, of uh, Maxwell Facial Implants of Jomi from the Academy of Vascular Integration, Dr. Eckert, he said to me, he goes, he said, well, can this patient floss in here? And I said, well, yeah, they can floss because they have to. They have to clean this out. And he said, the and he's right. He said, the only way that a patient could get floss between two implants is you have to have an open contact. He said, otherwise, you can't get the floss there. So not only are we causing these traps, these, these unnatural embrasures, now I have to leave an open contact for them to at least clean it out. So I'm just showing these are the problems. These are the things that I've seen over the years with my practice. <clears throat> Here's an argument that says, well, this implant could have been put a little bit closer so you wouldn't have had this big ledge and cantilever and, and area. Maybe it could, a custom abutment, but because of the tensile and compressive forces, this person fractured, fractured off the, uh, the porcelain. That's a, that's a bad day because they just paid a lot of money for this crown, and now they're coming in and they're saying, well, I want you to fix the porcelain. Well, you know you can't fix the porcelain. You have to, like on this patient, same thing. This gentleman came in to me from another office, and he said, well, my crown cracked. And I said, it sure did, you know, with all this unsupported porcelain. So I made an access hole. I unscrewed it. <clears throat> I made this all metal then with just a little facial veneering on this just to solve the problem of, of porcelain breaking. But there's nothing I could do about the uh, embrasures. And now you can see we're starting to have a little problem on that too. This is, again, one of my, a patient of my partner who was just pointing out, these are the custom abutments, but because they follow the tissue profile, you're still ending up with this. That's a little piece of cement we took out. And, and, and you're still ending up with this kind of a, a situation. <clears throat> again, you can put them together. You can tie implants to, to, together to support them. And we have a study that Duncan will go over about putting implants together. And you're making a tunnel. You're making all of these kind of problems for our patients. <clears throat> This is the most common thing I've, I'm starting to see. Patient came to me, we're having a little symptom with this uh, lower right second molar. And I thought, well, this margin isn't very good. I'm going to take this off. I took it off, ended up, we had to do a root canal. So we went ahead, did the root canal. It wasn't one year later. The tooth was still symptomatic. We extracted the tooth. Dr. Ranahan took the tooth out, put in a Nobel active, and we end up with this kind of a situation with a custom abutment, and, and um, a smaller crown just to help with the occlusion, and he comes in, and here we go. He's got all this trap, uh, this food trapped all in here. So here's our solution. When I go to the Academy of Osseo Integration and I go through the exhibits, there's about five booths like this, and they, and, and they even advertise, here's the solution for dental implants. So we're treating the effect. We're not treating the cause. You can have these, all these different size brushes, proxy brushes, pixers, all of these little um, uh, brushes you can carry in your pocket. Um, and, and so we, treat the, we basically are treating the effect and not the cause. So <clears throat> I started out this on my own. This is my favorite saying, that insanity is doing the same thing over and over, but expecting a different result. That's what we're doing. We're, it comes down to a round implant in a rectangular space. It's that simple. And there's no solution. No matter what we try to do, we're trying to get a different result. It'll never happen. 